Last week, an 11-year-old boy named Jacob Wetterling was kidnapped from the streets of St. Joseph, Minnesota. The effect on Jacob's family has been obvious, but his kidnapping has also torn the tightly knit social fabric of the entire town. Our last report tonight is from there. Here's ABC's Chris Bury. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you. And if you're returning, thanks so much for coming back. I'm excited to see you again. On my channel, we talk about a true crime story on Tuesday. So if that's something you might be interested in, you can go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below, as well as the bell icon so you can be notified when I upload only if you want to, no pressure. I also do wanna give a quick warning that some of the things that we talk about on this channel can be pretty heavy. So if that is something your mental health cannot handle, just do me a favor and click off this video. I'll catch you somewhere else, but your mental health will always be so much more important than any YouTube video ever will be. So with all of that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the video. Today's video was suggested to me on TikTok, but once I started researching it a little bit, I knew it was something that I wanted to do a deeper dive on. So uh, today we're going to be talking about Jacob Wetterling. Jacob was born on February 17th of 1978. Jacob's parents were Jerry and Patty. They had four children together and Jacob was one of the middle children. He was the second oldest child. So he had one older sister and then he had a younger brother named Trevor and then a younger sister named Carmen. Jacob was one of the sweetest boys ever. He was just so full of life and and he just, he had his entire future ahead of him. He was just one of those kids that you could just tell was excited about life and excited about where he would go. Over 12 and five feet tall. My whole name is Jacob Urban Wetterling. My favorite food is steak. My favorite color is blue. My best friend is Aaron Larson. Jacob loved football and hockey and he just, he really enjoyed sports and he really enjoyed spending time with his friends and his family, but especially his family. He was very close to his mother and also his younger brother, Trevor. The Wetterlings lived in a town called St. Joseph, Minnesota. I keep wanting to say Wisconsin, I'm not sure why, but they lived in St. Joseph, Minnesota. It was one of those small towns where if you forgot to lock your doors at night, it wasn't that big of a deal because more than likely nothing would happen. It was a really safe community and all of the community members kind of knew each other and all got along really well, especially the kids in the neighborhood. It wasn't unheard of to see kids out riding their bikes well after the streetlights came on. It was just one of those things that kids could do in this small town. October 22nd of 1989, Jacob was having an awesome day. He was having so much fun. Early that morning, he and his dad and Trevor had gone fishing and this was something that they really enjoyed doing together because they were able to bond and just spend some time together. But since all of them were huge football fans, they also wanted to make it back by 12 o'clock so they could watch the Vikings play. The game did start around noon and they made it home for that and were able to enjoy the game together. And then after that, they decided to go ice skating together. And it was just one of those days that was like the perfect day. Jerry and Patty had plans that evening to go to a dinner party at one of their friend's house. And so they left Jacob, Trevor and Carmen at home. Jacob was kind of in charge of watching Carmen. He was 11 years old. So he was kind of babysitting his younger sister, but it, Patty and Jerry did tell uh, Jacob that he could invite a friend over. Jacob invited his best friend, Aaron Larson over and they enjoyed the evening watching scary movies and vegging out and just having a good time. But around 9 PM, it seems like the group of boys got a little bored. And so they called their parents at their friend's house and Jacob asked Patty if they would be able to ride their bikes down to the local convenience store to rent a movie. Patty didn't want them going out because A, Carmen was at home and she would have been home alone and it was after dark at this point and it was after dark. She just didn't want them out alone. But the boys did that thing that I'm sure many of us have done where if one parent says no, we ask the other parent. And then uh, when they spoke to Jerry, Jerry said that that was fine as long as they wore reflective vests and took their flashlight with them. The boys had also already made arrangements with the neighbor to come and watch Carmen while they were gone. Jerry agreed to all of this and uh, told them just to be safe. 
So they went to the Tom Thumb convenience store where they uh, rented a movie. They rented The Naked Gun and then started making their way back to the Wetterling's house. This convenience store was not very far from the Wetterling's house and it wasn't unusual for the boys to ride their bikes to this convenience store. But not very far into their ride back home, a man came out of a driveway and he was masked and he had a gun. What the boys didn't know was that this gun was not loaded, but it's intimidating enough to have a gun put in your face and so this man told the boys to dump their bikes in the ditch and then told them all to go get face down. That's when he asked the boys their age and Trevor said he was 10 and Jacob and Aaron said that they were 11. So uh, this man told Trevor to run away and run into the woods and not look back. He told Trevor that if he looked back, he would shoot him and kill him. Trevor took off into the woods and just started running. He then told Jacob and Aaron to look at him so he could see their faces. And that's when the man told Aaron to also run into the woods and not look back or he would shoot him. And so Aaron took off and started running. But Aaron didn't listen and he did turn around and look back. But by the time he looked back, both Jacob and the man were gone. After Aaron realized that Jacob and the man were gone, he ran to try to catch up with Trevor. When he did finally catch up with Trevor, they went directly to their neighbor house to the Wetterling's neighbor's house and told the neighbor what had happened. The neighbor immediately got on the phone and called Patty and Jerry and told them what happened. So Patty and Jerry made their way back home as soon as they heard the news and then the neighbor called the police. The police arrived within six minutes. Both Aaron and Trevor told the police what had happened and what um, had happened to Jacob, but the police initially didn't believe them. They thought that the boys had been playing with a gun and accidentally shot Jacob and were just coming up with this elaborate scheme to stay out of trouble. But Jacob was still missing and they needed to find him, so they immediately started searching. And it was soon into the search that they realized what the boys were saying was the truth, that this was actually what happened. Initially, the police officers thought that they would find Jacob very soon and it would all be over, but when they didn't find Jacob very quickly, it soon turned into the largest search party in Minnesota history. This case soon gained local attention and then national attention. The FBI got involved and even the National Guard got involved involved when searching for Jacob, but they didn't find anything. There was no sign of Jacob anywhere. Local community members soon started uh, what was called the Friends of Jacob Wetterling Center, and this center was created to continue spreading information about Jacob and making sure that his face was still seen everywhere. They would hand out flyers and uh, just spread information about Jacob. It didn't take long for them to get over a thousand applications from people just wanting to help. Any donations that were given to the center were put into a pot or like a reward for any information that would lead to Jacob. The FBI received thousands of tips, but none of these would pan out. But eventually they were led to a suspect and he lived in the community and his name was Danny Heinrich. Danny was brought in for questioning uh, in regards to Jacob's case, but he was soon released because they couldn't tie him to Jacob's disappearance. But before he was released, the police did gather DNA samples from him, which would come in handy much later on. Even though the FBI was getting tips on Jacob's case, eventually his case just went cold. No one could find Jacob. No one knew where he was. This case wasn't going anywhere. It eventually went cold and it would stay that way for many years. But that's when a crime blogger named Joy Baker got involved and that's where everything changed. Joy was looking for something to write about and that's when she stumbled on to Jacob's case. She read about it in 2010, so many years had gone by at this point and that's when she decided to reach out to, Joy, uh, to Jerry and Patty and to have a conversation with them about Jacob's case. Joy basically became a private investigator while looking into Jacob's case and she was able to connect the dots and find out that there were several other boys who had been abducted in that same area and 
the MO was kind of the same. She got really deep into the case and that's when she found Jared Skyrill. And I might have said his name wrong. If you know the correct pronunciation, correct me down in the comments. That way I can know for sure how his name was pronounced. But Jared's story is eerily similar to Jacob's. Just nine months before Jacob disappeared, on January 13th of 1989, Jacob was walking home when, and he was only a couple of blocks from his home, when a man approached him in a car. This man asked for directions and Jared was happy to give them to him, but that's when the man exited the vehicle and forced Jared into the vehicle. He then told Jared that he had a gun and he would use it if Jacob struggled. He drove five miles away where he essayed him and then released him, but he told him the same thing, that he was supposed to run and not look back. If he did, he would shoot and kill him. The description that Jared gave was very similar to the description that Trevor and Aaron had given the night that Jacob disappeared. The description that Jared gave was eerily similar to the one that Aaron and Trevor had given the night that Jacob disappeared. They said that he was a man of average height and weight, but the one thing that was really, that they really noticed about him was that he had a very raspy voice, like a very deep and raspy voice. So Joy was able to connect the dots between Jared and Jacob's case and a couple of other missing kids or kids that had been abducted in the area during that time. This was enough to pique the interest of the investigators on Jacob's case and led to them running the DNA that they had taken from Danny Heinrich against the uh, DNA taken from Jared's case. Turns out it was a match. Danny Heinrich was the one that had abducted Jared and since the MO was so similar to that of Jacob's abduction, they had to bring Danny Heinrich in for an interview when it came to Jacob's case. The sad part about it is the statute of limitations had ran out on Jacob's on Jared's case. So they were unable to prosecute uh, Danny for abducting and uh, essaying Jared. But because of this, they were able to get a search warrant for Danny's house. And when they made entrance into his house, they found images that um, were of children, if you catch what I'm trying to say. And so they were able to arrest Danny. Danny Heinrich was arrested in October of 2015. So 26 years after Jacob went missing, they arrested Danny. Good evening, Jacob Weiderling's family gets answers nearly 27 years after his disappearance. Today in court, Danny Heinrich revealed in haunting detail how he kidnapped, assaulted, and murdered 11-year-old Jacob Weiderling in 1989. In order to prove that he was in fact involved with Jacob's murder, he took investigators to the place where he had buried Jacob. Now here's where the case gets even worse. Danny accepted a plea deal. He agreed to plead guilty to one felony count of having images of children and he would confess to the murder of, of Jacob, but he would not be prosecuted for the murder of Jacob. So he was not charged with Jacob's murder. Jacob was finally found on August 31st of 2016. He was only 30 miles from where he grew up. Danny told investigators what he had done to Jacob after he took him. Danny says that he handcuffed Jacob in the car and he drove him uh, further away. That's where he essayed him as well. Danny had said that the reason he was able to avoid police that night was he was using a police scanner, but it just so happened that a police cruiser was turning down the road that he was on with Jacob, and that's when he got scared and decided that he had to kill Jacob. Danny says that Jacob was facing away from him, and the first time he pulled the trigger, the gun jammed, but the second time he was successful in taking Jacob's life. He then hid Jacob's body and came back the next day to bury him in a shallow grave. A year later, he came back to that same place and noticed that uh, part of Jacob's coat had become visible and that's where he took him and moved him to a different location and buried him in another grave. The most heartbreaking part of this confession is Danny said that Jacob was asking him what he had done wrong. Jacob hadn't done anything wrong. Danny was an evil human. And it breaks my heart to think that this sweet, innocent child was asking what he had done wrong to deserve this when he hadn't done anything. 
Danny was given a 20 year sentence for the uh, pictures that he had in his home, but the state did retain its ability to have a civil committal after he is released for uh, sexual predators. So it is unlikely that Danny will ever be free and able to roam in the public again. I think it was so unfair that he was not charged for uh, Jacob's murder. It is not justice for Jacob and it is not justice for Jacob's family. They deserved and continue to deserve so much better. But Jacob's family decided to start a foundation that later turned into the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center. It is here that they try to educate the public about people like Danny and what to do to avoid them. They have turned such a tragic event into something so beautiful and are just trying to help other families avoid what happened to them. It just goes to show that no matter how safe you think you are in your little town, something could always happen. Le evil is constantly lurking all around us. So just a reminder to please stay safe out there. This is personally why I think these stories are so important to talk about because we cannot forget these people and we cannot forget to stay safe and know the signs and know how to protect ourselves. So like I said, please, please stay safe out there, uh, protect yourselves and your loved ones and remember to hug your loved ones a little extra tight. I am sending you so much love and uh, yeah, that's all I have for you this week. Let me know if you think that justice was served because I just, I don't, I can't wrap my head around not prosecuting this man, but let me know your thoughts down below. And uh, yeah, I am sending you so much love, like I said, and I hope to see you next week. But other than that, I will catch you next time. Love you all.